cool i think we have a decent number of people joining in so we can start um welcome again everybody uh, to this webinar so the topic of today is hands on demo with enterprise elt tailored for heavy workloads we have kate winters with us uh, who's basically our uh, director of sales engineering and uh, just a few, uh, few things that uh, we'll have a q and a session post the webinar so while you are on it um, you can just post up your questions in the in the comment box and we can take it up right after cool i think um, kate you can take over awesome thanks so much radhika all right hi and welcome welcome everyone really excited about this webinar here again about uh, Heavy, uh, managing heavy workloads in ELT, um, yeah, in the enterprise. So again, I am our director of sales engineering here at Evo, and with that, we will get going. So I'm going to start with a quick slide deck. We'll run through that, kind of cover some of the topics that we're going to go through here, then go through a, a demo of the platform, and then, like we mentioned, there will be some time for some Q&A here at the end. So if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and we will get to them uh, once we go through the deck and get the demo. So, right, we'll get going. Okay, so uh, Enterprise ELT tailored for heavy workloads. So here's our agenda. We're going through the challenges that you are gonna come across in, uh, in Enterprise ELT, uh, main requirements for large data volumes, uh, replication mechanisms supported um, for our databases, basically how we're going through and replicating that data, um, considerations for scalable and automated uh, systems, and going through the product demo and again, Q&A. So first, let's hop into the challenges that you may come across with um, doing ELT in the enterprise. So extracting, uh, data uh, extracting data from live production databases this is uh, your production database. Uh, I was just describing this to uh, uh, to a customer we were talking to. That's that's like your baby. That's for a lot of cu customers. That's what their application runs on. That's where their most critical data resides. So you need a way of getting that data out without impacting that database. Just remember, at the end of the day, database is really just software running on a computer. So it's got physical limitations. It's got RAM. It's got uh, disk space. So. Uh, if you're in there not being efficient with how you're extracting that data, you can have a really bad negative impact on your uh, database overall, your customers, uh, your end users' experience, and so on. Uh, heavy workloads. Enterprise generally means lots of data. So you've got lots of data, heavy workloads, and you need a way to, to manage all of that efficiently. Variety of data uh, formats and um, honestly, just di different, disparate sources of data. So um, as an enterprise company, as you grow, you acquire more data sources, your production database grows in complexity and the number of tables and columns and all, all the different objects that you have in your database. So you need a way to, to manage all those different types of data and the different variety of data. Then of course, security. Security always first and foremost when, uh, when you're talking about data. So now we're getting into handling uh, large data volumes. Again, this is incumbent with, uh, with the enterprise space. So you want to have no impact on the production database. And we we're just covering that. Very important, both for um, internal uses of that database, but also a lot of times that's tied to, uh, that's tied to your application or the, the lifeblood of your company. So you want to make sure that you're not um, anything that you're doing to get data out of there is not impacting actually getting data in or updating uh, in that database. Um, handling large data volumes with low latency. Yeah. Uh, to be able to, to move data, especially large amounts of data with, with low latency, very important, but there's, a, there's also a balance in there. Again, going back to what we were just talking about with uh, the production database, there's, um, yeah, just some, some trade-offs in being able to, to do that and do that efficiently accurate data for analytics. So you wanna make sure that the data that you're getting out of your database and reporting on is correct and complete. So again, very important and uh, something that's always at the, the forefront of any decision you're gonna be making with your data and the reliability of the data. You need to make sure that not only that that data is accurate, but it's also there. 
and available to you whenever you need it around the clock and uh, it's it's all there and complete so you've got to have reliable data and again as you scale up and bring in more and more data and increase the, the volume of data the more difficult it is to, to wrangle that data and ensure that it is reliable so going in diving in a bit into the the topic of replicating data from these databases so Here's uh, our five most common databases that uh, we support here at Evo. We do have more, but these are these are the ones that that definitely come up the most. And this is how we're extracting data on an ongoing basis, so that we can capture, do CDC on the data, ensure that we're getting a accurate read of it, and persisting that downstream into your destination, but also having minimal impact on that production database. So for Postgres, we use write ahead logs or wall, uh, Oracle, redo logs, MySQL, bin logs, MongoDB, we're using the op log, and for SQL Server, support change tracking and CDC. Uh, just be clear, the, the mechanism of CDC, not the, the concept of CDC, which of course we're doing, but yeah, there's always a, there's always a fun uh, um, explanation that, uh, that comes into that when, when talking about CDC with, with SQL Server. But, these are the, this is a really key feature of, um, of Evo. And honestly, any replication tool should be using um, other methods other than reading data directly from a source table in a database so that they can efficiently capture these changes and again, replicate those versus those make a faithful replication to your downstream data warehouse. Um, by doing it this way, um, it allows us to not have to, again, put a ton of load on the database and just tell us what has changed, anything that is new or different, maybe anything that was deleted from the source side. That also leads to a uh, fast and efficient process. So not only are we having a minimal load on your database, um, we're able to extract that data quicker. And we'll get into the, the details of specifically how Hebo does that here in a bit. But again, just high level here on what are the different methods and um, logging mechanisms that we use to replicate data from these prominent database sources? So some other things to, to keep in mind with enterprise ELT. Um, you got to find the right data stack, and uh, the data stack needs to meet all the um, schema and, uh, data requirements that you have. So again, you have a lot of disparate sources. Um, you have different data within your, maybe it's in your database or CRM. Um, some of it's very relevant to your analytics and reporting use case, some of it's not. So identifying all the data that you need and identifying a way to reliably extract that data and make sure you get it into a place where you can begin to report on it and you can trust that data that you're actually reporting on. Um, supporting, supporting scaling, so both horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. Um, we realize not everything is, your business isn't linear, whether it's a cyclical thing from a certain time of the year, could be times a week, could just be throughout the day. You need a system that's um, going to be able to meet your, demand, meet your demand um, in real time and scale with you as you grow. Again, both in the short term, whether this is a matter of uh, the, the scale of a day, you have, you have a huge influx of data throughout the day or just scaling with your company as it grows over time. Um, you also, and in doing all this, you wanna select something that is cost-effective and reliable. So you can throw a ton of resources at something and uh, do all the compute that you, that you want, but at the end of the day, that's gonna be extremely expensive, both to just, just upfront to pay for that compute and also to maintain and manage down the road. So um, you need to, really consider you know, what you're selecting, what's, what's important to you, and keeping in mind um, something that's reliable, that's, again, going to scale with you as you grow, going to ensure that the data that you need and that's important to you is reaching your destination, and it's doing all that and not costing an arm and a leg. Um, and again, uh, constructing a scalable platform for, for future growth. That's what I was talking about just a second ago with... Um, Scaling not over not only in real time but also uh, as your company grows. We always hope that um, whether it's a twenty-person startup that we're working with or, or an enterprise company that uh, 
um, that we're working with. Obviously, we're there for, to help continue to help make them successful. So as your company grows, as those, your data needs uh, continue to grow and your data volume grows, we want to be able to uh, be able to support that, support you in that process. Okay, so probably thinking why use an automated tool like Kibo? This is something that uh, probably question many of y'all have thought of before or uh, you're going, going, currently going through a process of um, using a tool that maybe it's a, in a home built system or um, a platform that allows you to, to build your own ETL. So Kibo is uh, actually built to handle large data volumes. So it's one of the, the core features of our platform and um, how we extract, especially from databases, it, and how our philosophy of extracting that data and processing it um, really built to handle the large data volumes. Um, flexibility in schema management. So a lot of automated tools out there are gonna force you into a specific schema, a specific way to, to land data into a destination. So maybe a little bit of a homage back to the ETL. But what Hebo allows you to do is customize your own schema if you want to. Again, you can always hand that over to Hebo. We, that's a core part of our platform. Automatic schema detection. We'll find out what the schema is on the source side and persist that over to the destination. You don't have to worry about any of it, but there are specific use cases here and there where you need something mapped and uh, you need a data type in a, in a specific way, fields mapped a specific way uh, to meet your requirements for your entire data platform and your downstream jobs. Hebo allows you that flexibility. Security, and we, we mentioned this earlier, security is paramount. You have to have that um, uh, security is first and foremost for Hebo. We're just a we're just processing the data, just a data processor. It'd be classified in uh, GDPR terms, but um, across the board, we're making a secure connection to your disparate sources, um, processing that data through our secure environment where data is encrypted at all times and transit at rest. And then once that data is successfully loaded into the destination, it's removed from our platform. And then within our system, we have fail safes like object expiration, expiration policies. If anything ever goes wrong within the pipeline, you never have to worry about still data um, sitting at rest. Even if it's still encrypted, um, that'll be taken care of automatically. And uh, support and minimal downtime. Obviously, all this is great, but you have to, the lights have to be on to, to make sure that all these things are happening. And that's what Hebo is responsible for. I always like to frame this as we're the active partner in our relationship with our customers. So we're the ones who are making sure that the lights are on, making sure that the data is getting delivered. And if you ever have questions, run into issues, we have run the clock support, um, it's world class, and there to help you troubleshoot anything that, uh, that you may come across. All right, so we're gonna do a really quick architecture walkthrough here of Hevo. So like I was mentioning, um, starting from left to right, we create secure connections to uh, whether it's your source database, this could be a database in the cloud, it could be on-prem, doesn't matter where it is, so long as uh, we can connect to it. And we also understand that a lot of times you can't just whitelist an IP on a, on a security group. So we do support numerous methods for connecting to uh, databases that might be locked down. Again, this could be a, on a on-premise network or just a, a lockdown VPC within your uh, cloud account. So support site-to-site -site VPN tunnels, um, private link, VPC peering, um, SSH reverse SSH, so on. So lots of different mes methods for ensuring that we have a secure connection and are able to extract that data from again, your database, whether that's um, cloud hosted and ROM-PREM. Um, in addition to databases, the, with enterprise, a lot of this is gonna be focused on, on those database sources, but we do support over 150 SaaS and uh, other sources. So uh, things like your CRM, reporting tools, Google Analytics, Facebook ads, and then files, um, anything coming over from, from FTPs or SFTPs, S3, um, again, making secure connections. And uh, we'll initially do a historic sync of the data that's um, currently in your, whatever the data source is. And then we move over to just capturing incremental data. So Hevo's platform runs in AWS and GCP. 
and you have the ability to select that. And once the data is in our platform, we process it. And the thing that's driving all of this is Kafka. So back to the specific topic about databases, Kafka allows us to uh, continuously stream data as it changes from your source database. So we're capturing those changes from the logging mechanism, whether that's bin logs, right ahead logs, soft logs, whatever it is for that specific database, We're using Kafka to um, tap into those logging mechanisms, stream those changes, and then uh, quickly and efficiently process that through our platform and persist those changes downstream into your destination. So Hevo is a, uh, a multi-tenant environment. All data is in all customer accounts and pipelines are logically separated. Again, data is encrypted at all times and transit and at rest. Um, and over here, you have our ingestion service. So this is, again, being a shared environment. This is a, a shared resource for the ingestion service. What you also have, I move to the next slide, is the option for <clears throat> reserved nodes. So we are a fully managed Kafka queue. Uh, quite possibly one of the largest Kafka, Kafka queues in the world. So uh, we have our Kafka queue and uh, what we can do is actually spin up reserved nodes for you. So uh, that way, if you have very strict uh, SLA requirements for moving your data, again, specifically for databases, we wanna be able to, to tap into those logs, stream these changes from your source database and persist those into the destination um, as quickly as possible. So. Um, if your use case calls for that, you have a large protection database and you still need that data real time or um, streamed into your destination, it was a great choice for you here. Your other options, again, talking about cost effective, generally other options that are going to come into play here are going to be a lot more cumbersome, very extensive setup, um, usually deployable agents, things like that, that um, really increase both uh, the hours spent in initial configuration and then management of the systems down the road. Hevo being a SaaS platform, cloud hosted, there's nothing to install. Um, our pre-configuration requirements, very straightforward. We walk through them, in most cases, just a few minutes. And um, once you've done that, create your pipeline in Hevo and data is off and running. Right, so you know, coming back into this uh, topic of should you use a fully managed solution? Should you build something yourself? Should you use a platform that allows you, uh, basically a tool that allows you to build your, your own ETL pipelines? What's, what's the right choice for you here? So coming back to the, we call it the build versus buy uh, decision that you'd be looking, looking into. So if you built your own ELT, that's uh, certainly an option that you have out there. There's tons of resources. Uh, each cloud has their own platforms like AWS Glue that uh, you can go in, build your own ETL. You can get on Reddit and go to the e uh, ETL uh, subreddit, look up a whole bunch of Python scripts, Airflow, a lot of different ways to build your own ETL. Um, and some of the benefits of doing that is if you're building it, you can customize it and control all the different variables that you want. It's completely built for your use case. Um, you can tailor it to your specific business needs. Um, and it looks really cheap up front. You're like, hey, I, I don't need any, I don't need to pay for anything to install this Python package or um, you know, use, a, you know, use a tool that again, says it's free up front to, to use. But what you get into is, that initial development effort that cost a whole lot more time and effort to, to go in and build a pipeline from scratch than it would be to you know, plug into something that's already pre-built, a service that's ready to go for you. Um, it's also gonna take you longer to implement instead of you said, five minutes to um, do the pre-configuration and set up a pipeline in a SaaS service. You're still gonna have to build that pipeline and not only are you going to have to build it, usually the biggest pitfall in building your own pipelines is the ongoing maintenance. So pipelines are, it's data. Things change. Pipelines are inherently brittle. 
and they will break. And when they break, whether it's uh, because a, a driver expired on your Postgres database or um, somebody made a schema change, maybe you didn't account for that, um, maybe an API was deprecated. When they break, unless you have a dedicated engineering resource there to fix that, you're going to have downtime. And that's going to be time spent away from whatever that engineer's primary role would be. So the ongoing and unforeseen and unpredictable nature of the maintenance that's required in building your own pipelines is one of the biggest pitfalls that, um, that we see prospects looking uh, or coming across when they either start building their pipelines. Usually they come back to us uh, a few months later and say, okay, yeah, you're right. That was, that was a lot more difficult than, uh, than we thought it would be. So let's look at the pros of buying an uh, ELT tool. So rapid impl implementation and deployment. Again, few clicks, um, create as a user in your database, enable logs, usually ready to go again, just a few minutes. Um, establish features and reliability. This is a big thing here. So hebo has been around since 2017. It's given us a seven year head start on anyone trying to go through and build their own pipelines. We've gone through, we've, we've worked through edge cases, we've worked through all the different nuances of all these databases, how to handle different data types, loading into certain destinations, uh, all, all the different esoteric things that you can only experience and know are there if you've actually been hands-on with, uh, with working with these different platforms. So, um, and, and we have also, we understand we've, we've built those, uh, built our platform around our, our customers' requirements. So you have that reliability that, uh, that's tailored to, um, to meet the core needs that you have. Um, and it's also supported by us and we're continually improving and making updates to these platforms. So like I said earlier, we're the responsible party here. Um, we're the ones who are making sure that the lights are on. We're the ones making those small little tedious changes, like again, updating a driver for, uh, for your database for, for the pipeline that we're using. Those little things, that's our core business. That's what we're responsible in doing for you as the customer. And that's what you can rely on us to do. But again, uh, in all fairness, we want to point out some cons in buying a ELT platform. There is a licensing cost. Um, so again, looking at something head to head with, it was like, oh, like I said earlier, if I, if I just build this, I don't have to pay for anything versus, you know, Hebo over here is, uh, saying how to pay a licensing cost to use this. True, there is a licensing cost, but that cost is predictable. Um, you know what you're paying for and you know what you should, you're going to get out of that. And uh, in the long run, we'll get into this uh, here in a bit, it's almost always going to be cheaper um, going with a licensing cost versus um, paying for this and building it in-house. Um, being an automated ELT platform, there's only so much customization that you can do, especially if you have those really niche uh, use cases or have really specific business needs. But one of the core components of this transition to ELT is being able to extract just all the data that you need, all your disparate sources, load it into your warehouse and handle those customization options there. So whether that's working with your different data types, modeling, uh, massaging your data, that's what cloud data warehouses today are really built for. Handling large volumes of data and being able to scale compute with separation of compute and storage. You don't have to pay for more storage when you just need a little bit more compute at a specific uh, time. So you have the flexibility of using the cloud data warehouse and being able to transform and work with your data there but you need to get that data there in the first place. And that's what Hevo is focused on. Um, and then from a, a feature standpoint, dependency on the, the vendor's roadmap. Again, our, our customers, they tell us what they need and what we need to build. We're constantly taking feedback um, from our customers, from our prospects, um, what they need, what features are important for them and continually um, adding, updating our roadmap. But if you have a really specific feature, 
and it's a source that no one's ever heard of and that you know that that could be something that could take a little bit longer to to get on the roadmap to to get built out again we're going off of really what's what's driving um, the majority of our customers and what those um, top feature requests are so uh, digging in a little bit more into the, the actual cost of building a data pipeline in-house. So in this example, we have really straightforward, uh, uh, we have five connectors, let's say it takes five weeks each to, uh, to build each of them. Um, and then you have your engineer salary here, as well as maintenance. And that would just be scheduled maintenance. This doesn't even count for, for unscheduled maintenance. So you're looking at somewhere around, um, let's say, you know, a conservative estimate here, 103K to, uh, to build your own data pipeline in-house. And that's just to have, um, that's just to have the pipeline, have it set up. That doesn't account for how reliable is the data? You know, how, how much time has this engineer spent working with these sources? What happens if you add a new data source? Again, a lot of companies grow, add new sources, for new SaaS systems, migrate to a new, new platform. Are you accounting for all of these different changes that could happen throughout your, uh, throughout your data platform in the course of a year? So again, this is, uh, this is just trying to really make it tangible for what the down the road cost would be. Again, you look at something like, yeah, we can just build this in house. You don't realize there is a human capital part to that. That, in, that engineer has to go build these data pipelines and maintain them. To be honest, building data pipelines is the most glamorous thing in the world. Um, once upon a time, I heard uh, someone describe uh, ELT as data plumbing. Really, really, really important. We don't want to imagine a world without plumbing, but not the most glamorous work, but it's extremely, extremely important. Um, however, a lot of engineers may not find that uh, the most exciting or invigorating uh, work to be doing. So considering um, allocating an engineer to be doing building data pipelines and updating these really tedious things versus having them working on um, gaining clean data or cleaning value from your data or other projects to, to help improve your, uh, your platform, your product, your company, is uh, another decision that, that should be considered there as well. Okay. So again, this is, uh, this is going into what a, uh, what a quote for a typical use case like that would have been. So we're looking at 103K roughly for, uh, for building that yourself and that price you can generally come out to about 14K for, for Hevo. All right, so really quick, I'm gonna hop over to the Hevo platform and I'm gonna go through a demo of connecting um, data from an Oracle database to and syncing that to Snowflake. So uh, when you sign up for your Hevo account, you, have, you can go do two different paths here. There's really no right way to do it. You can set up your destination first, or you can set up a, a source first. In this case, I already have a, a destination here set up with Snowflake. Um, I input all my Snowflake credentials. We walk you through step-by-step, step, provide you a guide and a script for what you need to run in Snowflake to ensure that we can connect and have the right permissions um, uh, to, to run our jobs and complete everything that we need to do to successfully load all of your data in Snowflake. So really straightforward process there uh, to get your destination set up. And we're gonna hop over here and create a new pipeline. So again, Hebo has over 150 native uh, sources today. So in this case, I'm gonna click Oracle and great feature that I love as a sales engineer is to, uh, I can just copy this configuration from another, uh, an existing config. So I don't have to go in and re-input all of, uh, all my different credentials here that, uh, that I already have. And like I was mentioning with Snowflake, we walk you through step-by-step, step, uh, any requirements that you need to complete 
on the source database uh, in order for us to do uh, our replication jobs. In most cases, um, things like redo logs are, uh, or Red Hat logs for, for Postgres, they're already going to be enabled. It's usually just a matter of creating Hevo uh, a user so that you know what, you know, uh, a well-named user, something like Evo users, so that you know what that user is being uh, being used for. It doesn't get uh, doesn't get swept up in some spring cleaning, and um, yeah, and making sure that we can gain access to that database again, going through those different connection methods that uh, that I mentioned earlier. So, really quick, I'm going to put in my password here, and I have. Um, Relog set as my replication method. A um, couple other bells and whistles here that you can tweak specifically for your Oracle instance. One is a, a poll interval. So um, how often we should check for um, redo logs in uh, when we're in streaming mode. Um, we can also limit the number of um, rows that Hebos fetches and the logs for, um, for each poll that we do and uh, a long transaction window limit. So again, a couple other specific um, enterprise features that we have tailored to Oracle. Additionally, we have uh, some more advanced features here. These are just across pretty much uh, any of our databases, um, load historical data. By default, we're gonna load all of your historical data from the tables that you select uh, for us to sync. You also have the option to skip loading um, all that historical data. Maybe you already have all this data from, uh, from another vendor somewhere already in your destination and you just want to capture new data going forward. You do have that option here with Hebo. So we'll just pick up, tap into those logs, read from this point forward and um, sync that data over to your destination without having to do a historical sync. So I'll have the option to, to merge tables with same name across different schemas and then including new tables by default um, in your pipeline. So this feature allows you to have more control over the security if, uh, let's say, you add a new table. Um, do you want that table automatically synced over to Snowflake or not? So you have the ability to, uh, to tell Hevo, do you want that to happen or not? So I have everything configured here that I need. Test my connection. We're all good. And now it's going to pull up the, the schema from the tables that I have here on the source side. So here I can select and deselect what tables and objects I actually want to bring over. But we're going to bring over both of those. Now I'm going to choose my destination. I already have Snowflake configured, so I'll select Snowflake here. And I can give this an optional um, table prefix. So uh, this way, if I, again, whatever my downstream BI is expecting or modeling layer is expecting from a, from a table name perspective, um, I can either choose to just leave it as is, as it is coming over from the source. Again, Hevo isn't going to do anything crazy here and decide to rename a whole bunch of columns or tables. It just takes the names of the um, source columns, the tables, your source schema, and process that over to your destination. Um, and then I mentioned this a little bit earlier during the um, during the slide presentation, but here's the option for to turn on or off auto mapping. So I can do this at the pipeline level. Um, I can also do it at the specific object level. I can go down to certain tables if I need to uh, map again, certain data type a specific way so that it's um, compatible with what my downstream jobs and the destination BI tool are expecting. So here's where I can toggle this on or off. Um, for the sake of this, uh, I won't bore y'all with mapping a whole bunch of Oracle columns. And I'll click Continue here. And that's it. So I'm setting up this pipeline while it, uh, while it runs that historical sync. I'll hop over here to an Oracle database that I already have running. So um, you can see here, I have this one prioritized. This one is running in streaming mode. And uh, you can see a breakdown of different events that we have for um, over the past uh, change your time window, two hours, 24 hours, a couple, couple weeks. Um, you have this reporting right here in the UI. You can also go back into a specific pipeline, 
you ever need to change or update settings, not super common, but um, you can always edit the pipeline if you need to. Um, transformations, we have the option for some light preload transformations using Python. Um, again, general, uh, general things here that, that folks might be doing again tweaking a data type if they have a specific need for that or uh, maybe masking data. So you can just adds a little bit of flexibility into, um, into your ETL pipelines. So again, with, uh, with the shift to more of an ELT approach, um, you a lot of that flexibility and any sort of customization has, has really been lost. You're, you're locked into exactly how your ELT vendor does something. And it's, it's their way or the highway. So with this preload transformation here with, with Hebo, we add, again, just a little bit of flexibility and customization into the, the classic ELT paradigm. Schema mapper, again, this is that um, automatic schema mapping that uh, I was telling you about. I can, again, come in here, term, and if I want to uh, auto map the schema or if I want to manually change uh, any of these data types or fields, quick load status um, for different objects that I'm syncing over. You can see what the performance is. Looks like these are syncing in about 30 seconds. And an activity log. So you can see all the, all the changes that go on and um, again, whether it's for the settings for the specific pipeline. Cool. And then if I hop over to Snowflake here, just take a look at the data that we're syncing over again. Uh, when you create your connection to Snowflake, you don't have to create any tables. You don't have to create any schemas or anything. Uh, you just create a user for Hevo. We take care of the rest. Um, that goes for you know, the initial sync and ongoing. Um, with uh, our schema mapping feature, that handles changes to your schema as they occur over time. Do you change a data type? Do you add a column? Do you drop a column? Um, change a column name? Hevo adapts to that automatically and persists those changes to your destination. This isn't anything where you have to go manually change things in Snowflake and BigQuery and Redshift. You're handing all of that over to Hevo so that you can trust that that data is reliably landing in your destination. And you can focus on modeling, joining that data, gaining use out of it, sending it downstream, creating pretty dashboards in, a, in your BI tool. The last few things here in the, the Hevo UI um, and go to, to team here. I can add more users uh, if I need to. Uh, and we don't limit you on the, the number of users that you can have uh, for your platform. We also have role-based access controls. So if you can have fine-tuned controls for um, what access a specific user needs to have within your platform. Um, so I have the option to enable um, syncing logs to AWS CloudWatch. Um, enforcing uh, authentication mechanisms, whether that's uh, two-factor auth, Google authentication, or if you have a SAML 2.0 provider, we support those things like um, Okta, um, Ping1, so on and so forth. If it's a SAML 2.0 provider, we're able to enforce that um, sign-in mechanism here in your account. And finally, you can come to alerts. And you can subscribe and unsubscribe to uh, the different alerts available that, uh, that we'll send you for um, for your different pipelines. We also have an integration with uh, Slack, so you can get your alerts there as well.